Hello. Welcome to the final episode of Wean Off the Cuff, Riverdale. Today, our topic, the final episode of Riverdale. Episode 20 of Season 7, Goodbye, Riverdale. We start 67 years in the past, in the future, in the present. Betty is very old. Everyone else that she knew from Riverdale times has died. She's sitting with her granddaughter, Alice, reading Jughead's obituary. She feels she must return to Riverdale as she's the only one left and she's beginning to forget so much. And her granddaughter says, sure, okay, if you're feeling up to it, Grandma, you're really old and you're sickly. And that night, having fallen asleep, perusing her beloved yearbook, old Betty wakes up to discover Jughead in her room. Not old Jughead. May or maybe not dead Jughead, but writer Jughead. He's dressed like Jughead from the original seasons of Riverdale with the beanie, the loose suspenders, the flannel. He's basically... I think we have to accept he's writer Jughead from the bunker, the Jughead who controls all of fate, time, space, and everything that exists. He's also a little bit of an angel Jughead, just as Angel Tabitha was an angel, just as (laughs) the Archangel Raphael was an angel, but we don't have time to get into that. That was last season. Anyway, angel writer Jughead appears in the night, and he offers to take old Betty back to any day in her youth. And she wants to go back to the day that they got their yearbooks in senior year because she missed that day due to having the mumps. So he invites her to pass through the door of her bedroom. And when she does, she returns to the 1950s, 67 years in the past, in the future, in the past. She is moved by the return to her room, the return to her young self, Everything being as it was, she peeks out the window and says, Wow, there's Archie. There's Archie's room. How many times did I look through that window? And writer Angel Jughead says, Probably thousands. And in that very window, they can see Archie and his mom discussing about how he wants to go build highways out west for a few months. And Archie's mom knows it won't be a few months. If he goes out west, he'll stay there because... He has the dream of going west. And I think as we all know at this point in the show, the dream of going west is (laughs) gay-coded. But we'll see how that shakes out in the conclusion of this episode. Betty asks Angel Writer Jughead to remind her what happened to Archie's mom. And Angel Writer Jughead says that she continued to work at her dress shop and a few months after Archie's departure, a lovely woman named Brooke, who is, of course, the same person who was... Archie's mom's wife for a couple seasons and then they got divorced comes to the dress shop they hit it off they fall in love and Brooke moves in with Mary and they live happily ever after so interestingly (laughs) Mary had a more successful gay marriage (laughs) in the time before gay marriage was legal gives us something to think about but we can't linger there's too much to happen Betty goes downstairs and she finds her mother Alice and her sister Polly yucking it up in the dining room. Polly is super pregnant, and Alice is a successful plane stewardess after dumping Hal fucking finally. They're both happy. Betty is so delighted to see them again, but she's also a little sad because she will have to leave them to go to school now. And on the way out, she asks Angel Rider Jughead, What happened to Alice? He's like, yeah, she was a successful stewardess for a while, but then one day she was on a flight and the pilot died. Uh, And so she had to take the plane. She flew it herself. She saved the plane. She got a rich new husband because he was so impressed by her saving all their lives. And together she and her husband traveled the world until they died. And Polly gave birth to her twins, whom she foolishly once again named Juniper and Dagwood, although this time they weren't the products of incest, so that's a plus. (laughs) 
And she never performed as polyamorous again. And Betty is both sad and happy about this news. Moved in several ways. And we're left to wonder... Why do they keep trying to make it happen that Betty's mom is a good mom? <laughs> She's been a fucking awful mom. <laughs> they keep being like, Betty, it's, now it's time to reconcile with your mom. No, Alice, fucking reconcile with Betty, Jesus. <laughs> she was awful. <laughs> but that doesn't mean she doesn't deserve to have a rich husband travel the world, because she so does, because she's a hashtag girl boss. Betty and Angel Rider Jughead go to Riverdale High. And she says, how can this be? Is this real? Is this a dream? Angel Rider Jughead says, it's in between. Veronica appears, and of course no one else can see Angel Rider Jughead, just Betty. And she talks, Betty talks with Veronica about this being the final day. And then, as they go inside, Tony reads a Langston Hughes poem over the intercom in her function as class president about dreams, about continuing to hold on to your dreams. And she reminds everyone that they have the power to make change if they can only dream at first. Because <laughs> they, you know, they had to bend the long arc of history towards justice. I don't know if you remember, but that was the theme of the season. <laughs> and Betty and Angel Rider Jughead go to the Blue and Gold office and they reminisce about all the great hard-hitting stories about civil rights that Tony wrote for the paper and how she always kept it topical and with the, with the pulse of current events. <sighs> but Betty asks not to find out what happened to Tony yet. She goes to collect her yearbook from Cheryl, who is utterly disgusted <laughs> by the fact that Betty's at school after having the mumps and only will talk to her once Betty promises that she's not actually sick. So then Cheryl invites her to an art show at the dark room and a party at Thornhill after that. Betty takes her yearbook. She goes to get it signed by Fangs and Midge, who are so excited because they're finally getting married because Fangs is successful. He's got a gold record. He's about to go on an amazing summer tour with all the biggest stars. But Angel Jughead knows that Fang dies <laughs> in a terrible tour accident when his bus jackknifes off the road, road in the Rocky Mountains and he goes down just like the Big Bopper Man. <laughs> And Betty's, of course, sad about this, but at least Midge and her daughter live in comfort with all of Fang's music royalties. And it gives us something to think about, because Fang's life was constantly under threat since he was a, like a B, C-tier character. And some of us may recall that he was actually shot by Reggie and he almost died back in season two. And you know, in the end, fate still got him. The town always wins. But Betty is interrupted in her sad reminiscing about dead fangs because Kevin appears to invite her to lunch outside with him and Clay. And they talk about how this is amazing. It's unbelievable. This is the last time they're going to eat lunch outside together. And Kevin and Clay reveal that they are moving to New York City because uh, Clay is going to study literature and Kevin is going to study musical theater writing. And they're Parents, specifically Kevin's mom and Clay's dad, support them and know about their relationship and believe in them. And Angel writer Jughead says they have a beautiful life together in Harlem. They're soulmates. <laughs> he says they lived beautifully and survived so much. Um, and he, I'm not saying that means AIDS, but I think that it means AIDS. But the point is that they didn't die. They both lived until 2021. Gay Kevin passed away peacefully in his sleep, and his beloved husband, a few weeks later, because he went to the park to feed the pigeons, and then he died. Anyway, they're fine. They're soulmates. It's fine. Clay becomes a professor with tenure. He becomes a professor with tenure. And Kevin has his own off-Broadway theater troupe where he can stage his fucked up stupid musicals to his heart's content. And then Kevin turns the game back around on Betty, and he's like, yeah, Kevin, or, fuck me, Clay and I are going to, you know, live happily ever after. We've worked it out. Our relationship's going to last, but, um, 
Betty, what's gonna happen to you and the others? And she's like, what's the others? And he's like, you don't have to pretend it's me and Clay. We know you've been in a four-way relationship with Archie, Jughead, and Veronica. And she's like, oh, God, I got so old I forgot that. And I was like, that can't be real. Who, who could possibly forget being in a four-way polycule with their best friends from high school? But I asked my polyamory correspondent, and she said, oh, yeah, I totally forget stuff like that. I forget that I've had sex with some of my friends all the time. Um, and I guess that's one of the many reasons I'm not polyamorous. Anyway, yeah, as it turns out, the core four has been in a core four-way <laughs> all senior year. And Betty goes to the bathroom to giggle about it. And Cheryl runs into her and is like, what the hell are you giggling about, Betty? And Betty's like, just remembering what a fun year it was. And Cheryl storms out. And she's right, because then Betty would start evangelizing about the joys of polyamory to her. And Cheryl knows when she's, <laughs> she's getting her time wasted. <laughs> um... And then Betty goes to get her yearbook signed by Reggie. And Reggie is deeply wounded to discover he was not invited to the polycule. And I, too, am wounded on his behalf. I would invite Reggie to the polycule in a minute. That subsert fucking kick out Jughead. Jesus. <laughs> that boy's a loser. <laughs> He's not nearly as hot as Charles Melton. <laughs> and we know that Reggie is down to clown because he already had a three-way with Archie. I can't believe this. Fucking justice for Reggie. Okay. Hashtag justice for Reggie. And anyway, with the memories of the previous seasons, um, return to them at the end of junior year in the last episode, Betty explains that this is what kind of gave them the idea for the quad because now she had all these memories of being in love with Jughead and she had all these memories of being in love with Archie, and let's be real, she had all these memories of being in love with Veronica. And so, you know, they just, they started going on double dates, but soon they became quabble dates. <laughs> and they investigated almost every permutation. Barchi, Varchi, Veronica, Bughead, and of course, Veronica. Interestingly, never on screen Jarchi. And I think that's fascinating. So many people were pulling for the Jarchi long con, but Roberto gave us gay Archie without Jarchi. And honestly, good for Archie. <laughs> Archie, Archie's sexuality deserves better than to be defined by Jughead. <laughs> All of our characters are lucky that they escaped having Jughead be their only primary partner. <laughs> That was the real power of the quad, <laughs> to spare everyone. And what's most most profound is the fact that Jughead is writing all this. We know that angel writer Jughead is the author of all of this. Um, and even he's like, no, no one should date just me. <laughs> and he's right. Speaking of angel writer Jughead... <laughs> He reveals that Reggie went pro in basketball, he came back and he farmed in Duck Creek until his parents passed away, and then he became the ball coach at Riverdale, and he was a good dad to his two sons, which is, I'm happy for him because of his awful abusive dad that he had in the previous seasons. I still think he could have done better than being the basketball coach at Riverdale High, but I guess the town always wins. After school at the Babylonium, Veronica feeds Betty some absinthe, and even Betty's like, this is a little early in the day for absinthe, Veronica. But it's because Veronica has to share tremendous news. She's moving to L.A. to be a movie producer, which is going to be good for her, but it's going to shatter the polycule, because she's going to be far from Riverdale, and she's going to be far from the others. But as Angel narrator, writer Jughead, reveals, she does become a very successful movie producer, as she was always destined to, she wins two Oscars, and she's buried in Hollywood, but she lost touch with the others, and it, it wounds Betty. It wounds her, the sadness of it all, but honestly, it's what Veronica deserved. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Veronica never put a relationship above her business, and I don't think she would now. She knows what she wants, 
She's a hashtag girl boss. And that girl's got a boss. <laughs> and I'm proud of her. And also, a flash forward to her as like a 1970s movie exec. Holy shit, her outfit is insane. And the other 70s outfits that they show in the flash forwards, oh my god. The wig that they put on Betty, but we're not there yet. At the dark room that evening, they see Tony and Cheryl's art show. It's Cheryl's beefcake, cheesecake, pinup, oil paintings of every cast member. I shit you not. Of every cast member in, like, a provocative but thematic position. Um, like, Jughead typing sexily and shirtlessly at the typewriter. And Archie, like, doing a shirtless car washing. Basically, it's Riverdale again. It's Riverdale again because it's, it's cheesecake. It's beefcake. It's, it's Riverdale again. And they're also selling the first six issues of the Black Athena Literary Magazine because the club has really taken off and it's had its own successful magazine. And Angel writer Jughead reveals that Cheryl was a successful painter and that she and Tony stayed together their whole lives. They moved to Oakland, California and became uh, the founders of like a cool writer's commune, artist commune, lesbian commune in... Uh, an old craftsman and holy shit their 70s styling is amazing and they had a son and their son was named Dale and their son named Dale is played in this scene by Vanessa Morgan aka Tony's real son who is I shit you not named River yes yes there's an on-screen character named Riverdale now. Roberto is such a genius. And then Betty's like, hey, what happened to No Eyebrows Julian? And Chuck is like, oh, fuck him, he dies in Vietnam. So rip to No Eyebrows Julian. And she's like, oh my god, what about Nana Rose? And he's like, oh, Nana Rose was reincarnated multiple times. No follow-up. That's just, that's just the truth. That's just what happened. That's just the truth about Nana Rose, man. And Principal Weatherby and Mrs. Thornton, the nice teacher, got married, which is like, whatever, who gives a shit? And then <laughs> she's like, wait a minute, what happened to gay Kevin's gay sheriff, gay dad, and Archie's homophobic gay uncle? <laughs> and Jughead says, oh, yeah, uh, they both got murdered by a hitchhiker they picked up named Chick. Those of you who are longtime viewers will recall that Chick was Betty's fake, evil, gay serial killer brother who got gay serial killer married to her actual gay serial killer brother who was also Jughead's brother <laughs> and now he's back just just a little off screen cameo to serially kill <laughs> gay Kevin's gay sheriff gay dad and Archie's homophobic gay uncle <laughs> and Betty's like not like concerned about it she's like oh okay and then she moves on and she's like oh my god look there's you and Archie and Veronica and you're talking you look upset and Jughead writer Angel Jughead is like yeah Veronica just told us about how she's leaving forever and we're upset you should go over there and help soften the blow so Betty goes over there and they talk about how Veronica's leaving and Archie says why does this have to be so final and I choose to believe that is a callback to his indelible line from the pilot when he's talking to his dad about his parents divorce and he's like why do you have to finalize things so finally <laughs> which is one of the first lines in Riverdale that was so bad I was like god it's got to be intentional because who but Archie would say why do you have to finalize things so finally because he's so fucking stupid but anyway the core four together reminisce about how they loved each other across two lifetimes and oddly, they all seem to remember all the events of the show, even though all of them except Betty and Jughead were like, oh, only show us the good things. And so I think as, as someone pointed out on Tumblr, it's possible when they were like, only show us the good things, Angel Tabitha just put on all the episodes because there were no, there's no bad times in Riverdale. <laughs> Every episode of Riverdale is a winner and I'm prepared to die on that hill. <laughs> And Archie says, you know, after everything we've been to, why don't we take one last ride in the hot rod? And they take a one last ride in the hot rod. And it's heartbreaking. It's beautiful. 
the wind is rustling through their hair. They're driving through the sweet water, the to through the forest, through Fox Forest, where Gay Kevin used to cruise, and they're driving over the bridge over Sweetwater River, the very bridge that Cheryl and Jason drove over in the first episode in the pilot on their way to swim out of the lake, and then Jason was going to fake his own death, but then he actually was killed. That same bridge, that same forest, it all comes back around again. The town always wins. And in fact, I was really excited at this scene because it seems like Blake Neely and Sherry Chung have dropped some new tracks, like they wrote some new Riverdale music for this finale episode, which is thrilling. And it even almost only subtly includes the Riverdale leitmotif, (laughs) which is one of the most pervasive (laughs) sonic arrangements ever known to God or man because it's just relentless how it's in every single track composed for the show across seven years of additional instrumental music. But outside Thornhill, Betty can't go in. She can't bear to because she knows this is the last time they're all together and it's too heartbreaking, but she doesn't want to say goodbye. And angel writer Jughead says... We all have to say goodbye. That is the arc of a life, and every minute counts. And so she rushes in. And during the party, Archie takes the record off because he wants to perform a poem he wrote about their lives and their beautiful times together. And it turns out each verse of the poem is a slam dunk on one of our heroes about the crazy, fucked up shit that happened in the previous seasons. He references... Betty's serial killer gene and how her trigger phrase was tangerine. He references how Veronica had poison powers and became a human dialysis machine. He references how Cheryl kept Jason's corpse in the basement. He references how goofy the serpent jackets were. He references how Jughead drove Mr. Chipping to throw himself out the window and die. He references Kevin's cruising in Fox Forest. He references how Fang's joined an organ-stealing cult. He references the two Reggies. And of course, he references the epic highs and lows of high school football. And for some reason, instead of all getting up and killing him, our heroes clap at the end of this poem. It's a fucking terrible poem also. I love Archie. He's a beautiful person. But after the poem... Betty is sitting alone, sadly, and Archie approaches, and he offers to make them endgame one last time. Perhaps they could still get married, but she turns him down and tells him the truth about the future because she remembers what happened to Archie. When he goes out to work on the highways, his mom was right. He stays in California. He gets married. He works as a construction worker in Modesto and just writes as an amateur. He raises a beautiful family. We have to assume he has gay sex on the construction crew. (laughs) And his body, upon death, is returned to Riverdale to be buried with his father, Fred Andrews. (laughs) And then there's a final Barchi kiss. But still, the return journey is not over because Betty has one last stop to make with Angel Rider Jughead. And that is, under the dawn, the grave of Terrence Pop Tate. Yes! At the end of the previous year, 1956, Pop died, (laughs) and he's dead now, (laughs) and he's died. And Angel Writer Jughead says, well, I believe that after death, someone like Pops would just keep doing what he loved, and that he's in the Pops in heaven right now, which is a canonical place that we know is real. And... I think that's a little fucked up, like, let the man have a day off. Running a restaurant is hard work. (laughs) Jesus. The poor old man had nothing but make milkshakes for fucking teenagers who look like 30-year-olds for his whole life. (laughs) Then Betty and Angel Writer Jughead sit together, and they talk about what happened to them in the future. Jughead's future. He becomes the publisher and head editor of Jughead's Madhouse magazine, which is just Mad Magazine, but it's by Jughead. And people loved it. And it was amazing, apparently. Which is like, okay, I guess. And we see Jughead in his 60s, 70s styling, and he has massive 
almost quasi Asimov sideburns. And that's a little bit of a serve on his part. And we learn that Betty also got into magazining. She became the publisher and founder and editor of She Says Magazine, a leading feminist magazine. And she was a writer and she was an activist. And she had a crazy wig. A crazy long wig. And huge glasses. And neither Betty nor Jug had ever married anyone. But Betty adopted a daughter was very happy to have his daughter and granddaughter and also as one of my correspondents pointed out by adopting instead of conceiving she stopped the serial killer gene <laughs> on her side juniper and dagwood and all bets are off and betty has no regrets about never getting married but jughead expresses some sadness and we have to wonder about that because this is jughead the writer too and so Jughead, in writing his own future, couldn't really imagine a world in which <laughs> someone would love him in a non-dysfunctional way, such as that it would be a good idea to get married. <laughs> oh, he's just like me for real. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Betty wishes she could come back to Riverdale and stay forever, but as angel writer Jughead says, you can't. You simply cannot. It's time for her to go. She returns to her old body and her old world, which is the new world, which is 67 years in the present. And old Betty and her granddaughter and her granddaughter's husband set out for Riverdale the next morning. And Betty looks out the window and she sees every single thing of Riverdale and she says goodbye to it. And she says goodbye to Sweetwater River and Fox Forest and to her house and Archie's house and all the sets are empty and shot in this like murky gray light and they're just like little trash and you know like 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 tumbleweeds blowing through them and the Babylonium and the Pembroke and Jughead's uh, train car, which happens to have the G and G rules and the Gargoyle King mask in it. Yes, the Gargoyle King is not forgotten, and the school, and all of Riverdale, which is empty and quiet and already kind of fading from this world. And then Betty says goodbye to time, and then the car pulls up into the parking lot. It pops. And Betty's granddaughter is like, oh my god, Grandma Betty, we're here. And she turns around and she's like, oh, Grandma Betty's sleeping. And her husband is like, honey, I don't think she's sleeping. <laughs> and it's true. Betty dies. <laughs> and another Betty, a Betty who is young, who has a long, beautiful ponytail, emerges from a red Cadillac of the dead into the parking lot of a thriving Pops, not an abandoned Pops. And she enters the Pops of the dead, and who should be the doorman but Jason Blossom, unspeaking and terrifying as ever. And the song that's playing is You're Mine. You're mine for all eternity, and everyone is there. Uh, Reggie and Fangs and Midge and No Eyebrows Julian and Kevin and Clay and Cheryl and Tony and Dilton and Cheryl and Tony are doing a puzzle that is the cast of Archie Comics in the Archie Comics drawing style. And Betty sits down with the core four, Archie and Jughead on one side and Betty and Veronica on the other and Archie says, you've come just in time. We got a strawberry shake, your favorite. And we're blasting your mind and we're all in pops forever, and there's no escape. And outside in the parking lot, Angel Writer Jughead gives the final speech. We're leaving them here. Forever 17, but we've also always been here. There was never a beginning or an end to Riverdale. <laughs> Riverdale was an oubliette, a prison. Every time they thought they could get out, they never could get out. The pops sign is waiting at the end of everyone's life because Riverdale will always be your home holy shit what the fuck and then as angel writer Jughead walks away we hear a booming typewriter sound a sign that our heroes are still the prisoners of a mad writer 
and it's true because they're Robertos for all eternity, <laughs> as he is the chief writer, the chief creative officer of Archie Comics. And he has, I would say, probably redefined them forever and fixed a totally new version of Archie Comics in the minds of possibly millions. <laughs> they're his. And then as the typewriter sound fades, who should pop up but the classic Riverdale title screen with the big, bold neon letters and the, like, scary noise. Because <laughs> it's still Riverdale. <laughs> it was still Riverdale. It never wasn't her. And that was the end of Riverdale. Knowing there's no escape. It begins and it ends here. In Pops, it was the story of a town and the people who live in this town. And it was Riverdale. <sighs> there will be more to be said about Riverdale, I'm sure, in the future, postmortems, retrospectives. Eventually, everyone will come around to see the truth. <laughs> that is the most critical <laughs> piece of media crafted possibly in our lifetimes, and that it speaks not only to the epic highs and lows of high school football, but indeed the epic low, highs and lows of all mankind. But I think in this finale, at this moment, we need to ponder what it all meant, that in the end, all the cartoonishly ridiculous things that they went through um, were no, no stranger or more horrible then the mundane awfulness of your life going on and people moving in and out of it and some of your dreams being disappointed and some of them being fulfilled and then in the end you get old and you die and you go to Pops and you're there again and it all starts over and the cycle remains unbroken because a mad god <laughs> rules over all time but at least... At least Archie had a threesome with a man. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> now we have to say goodbye, Riverdale. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> it's been an honor and a pleasure.